welcome to the poetry reading, the Swans Island Buoys and Other Line Poetry Readings with uh, Mr. Donald Junkins. Um, we uh, are privileged to have, this is your third re reading here at Nyack. It is. Uh, mm -hmm. privileged to have Mr. Junkins back on the hillside. Um, I'm going to forego a traditional introduction of uh, accomplishments um, and, uh, and more speak from the heart because uh, if I were, some of you know the influence that Mr. Junkins has had on my life and uh, my work and I consider him to be as good a poet as I've ever read and um, I remember the first time I heard him read in New Paltz and it was, uh, it was revolutionary to me in terms of you could hear craft I heard craft for the first time from a spoken poet. That's a remarkable thing to say, especially for any of you who have ever been to a bad poetry reading. Um, and uh, and it, it made me believe in something that I would lost faith in. And that was also remarkable to me. And it, it really led me down a road that brought me to Nyack. I, I know that in my heart for sure. And it led me to, uh, to write again. And um, so this this um, goes on. Um, I'm currently working on uh, a dissertation that will turn into a biography on Mr. Junkins' uh, life and work. And so, um, and what a privilege and honor it is to work with such a, a fine craftsman and a fine artist. I'm going to, uh, so with that said, I'm going to read actually two poems. Um, the first one is uh, Were Lions that I originally, when I had the idea for this reading, I told my friend Alex Shakespeare we had spent four, five days in Swan's Island with you. Yeah. We went to Swan's Island this past winter. Crazy thing to do. <laughs> Jim, yeah. it was a crazy and wonderful thing to do. And uh, we spent in the in the middle of the winter, uh, right after Christmas break, or right after the Christmas holiday. Um, we spent five days, five really wonderful days on Swan's Island uh, without any heat um, and uh, no running water. And uh, it, was, it was a really, a really great experience. And so I told Alex, I said, we let's have heat. You're right, we did have heat. We had, we had heat uh, from the fireplace. Uh, I said, at night, we didn't have heat. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, okay, well, we could have, but we, we roughed it. <laughs> it was, like I said, it was not torture. It was really wonderful. Um, awakening. So I told Alex, I said, why don't you write a poem, and to warm up the reading, you'll read one of your poems from Swan's Island, and I'll read one of mine. And um, so it, that sort of worked out. He wrote a really nice, wonderful poem. I'm going to read two stanzas of, of that poem, and then I'm going to read a poem that I wrote before. I have, I have yet to write my winter Swan's Island poem yet, but um, I, I'm going to read two stanzas from Alex's fine poem to uh, make do, and then read one more as a way of introduction. This is Alex Shakespeare's Memory of Summer Winter Version for Donald Junkins. Fourth and fifth stanzas. From the ferry landing, the island bobbed and pines like a dream with ghosts. Clyde Tory consorted with Odysseus, plowing his fields with an ass and an ox. Every island is Ithaca. Every January night, the stars burn like Roman candles in a pool of oil. The sea drops like a half-drowned deer on the rocks in the weeds, while the birch fire burns beautifully. And you read McDermott in a crazy tone of voice, echoing the leap to a wildly remote key in Beethoven's Allegretto, playing softly on the radio. These summer islands, frozen to the quick, are boy's dreams to a grown man's eye. I am further north than I've been in years. A ferry churns thick white water out of the blue. A few miles away, by the sea, near as the crow flies, Wyatt's brush took a rise to the Olsen place, ramshackle cousin to Clyde's. Christina, whose kind, craggy northern face Wyatt washed with a wet cloth. I was really in awe of it, he said. She was just like blueberries. 
He said, I think art goes as deep as love goes. I think you might agree. Like it's cut out of stone, really. <clears throat> and um, the second poem is a poem that I wrote, and um, I consider it to be a gift that was given, given to me. Because after I wrote this first book of poems, in which basically I uh, gave Mr. Jenkins the epigraph to the, um, to the book, in which he said once, four means nothing, it's just the pressure we put on the poem. Um, we had gone to a summer meeting in Swan's Island with Mr. Jenkins and his wonderful wife, Kaime, and uh, they had taken very good care of our family. And so I came back and I, I thought the book was written and then I, I sat down one day and I wrote this poem and um, he had said something when I was sitting out there. He was showing me um, poems that he had, uh, he had, that he's the editor of the North Dakota Quarterly Journal and uh, he had been sent all these poems and so he said, he said, here, take a look at them. And so I started reading them all <laughs> and I started pouring through them and he said, oh, you're really reading them. <laughs> he said, I don't get past the first line. <laughs> And later on, I emailed him about that, that statement. I said, that one statement to me was worth an entire semester's creative writing course. I pay attention to first line now, more than I ever did before. And then he said at another point during that time, he said, what is a poem but lines? That, that statement really uh, is what made this poem. Approaching the Western Way for Don and Kaime. Miles from mainland, we ferry southwest to Mount Desert Island, past the North Point into Mackerel Cove, where you wait off the charts. The unmapped approaches to Blue Hill Bay, the secrets of the Western Way. An 11 foot tide turns with sundown. Anna explores the edges of low tide, eyeing the low places just knowing she can avoid the fall I took by learning the way. We sit, in, we sit on the deck and watch night come on with the fog and the tide socked in on all fronts. The lobster boats haul traps at first light. The sun is caught up in the fog lingering along the tide line up Red Point and Brule Coat. We drink coffee by the cups fools as you tell stories of Auden rest, <coughs> poetry readings at Lowell's, and how everybody missed Anne in the biographies. The sisters rest out from the fog and plantation emerges under clear skies. We swim at fine sand, skip stones along the blue beach, gather together by the tide pools, watching the six hour ebb and flood like a compass. Miles from mainland, we ferry southwest of Mount Desert Island, past the North Point, out of Mackerel Cove, watching the Atlantic blue in Anna's eyes. Rachel's in reflection, holding Micah tight, scared of letting go. Jonah's mind wanders into the depths, the ocean covers, the mystery of secrets. Children, keep secret about discovering these approaches we've made beyond the Western Way. Please join me in welcoming Donald John. I want to read something I've never read in public before, but I have put it at the beginning of my next book of poems, which I've been holding in reserve for a couple of years. Um, because what I like to do in a book is I like to, I've been excerpting things that mean a great deal to me. And I, I, I intersperse sections of books with quotes by people that I respect and care about. Um, and this one is by the great Chinese poet, Li Bai. Some of you know him uh, through anthologies, of, including Ezra Pound's poems, uh, where he refers to Li Bai as Li Po. 
And in this quote, you see, Li Bai was a Tang Dynasty poet in China from the 8th century. And, uh, he's, and he wrote a billion poems. Jesus, I think he wrote more poems than uh, anybody. Uh, how, many, how many did he write? 12,000. 12,000 poems. Yeah. And um, we don't have all of them, but we have a heck of a lot of them. This is what he said in the 8th century in China. Fame lasts one second. Don't fall for it. Boy, that's so nuts. I mean, that's really... And he got it, you know? And, anyway. I'm going to read um, a couple of poems from my hometown, which is Deerfield, Massachusetts. We live in the woods on a dirt road, halfway up a, a small mountain in Western Mass. And um, this is called White on White, <coughs> Nearing Solstice. At the edge of our whitening grass, on the sawed maple stump, beside the rate-high blueberry bushes blending into the woods. A miniature bather bends to her lifted foot, so delicately contained within her alabaster tones, and muses on the undefined detail at her hand. With great precision, nothing seems on her mind. The snow surrounds her balancing foot and fuses white to white, tinier than our grain's original in the Louvre. Deeper as the storm now feathers its own afternoon design, waxen in December light as the snow drifts down. Our naked bather bends to her own affair focused beyond her sculpted, hand-coiffed hair. Still makes a pass overhead. Snow fog drifts through the maple bucket woods, essaying the scrawl of the early April brook through our backyard haze opening the book of the long-awaited spring, the one on the bedside table that we enter while we sleep, where the black brook lowers to the river and the code of the thin, swirling fog beneath the pin-still pines <coughs> unravels in the hurly-burly sweep before our eyes. Our dream world juxtaposes mirror, glass, and tone, where spring reruns its personal play. But wide awake it comes as a disappearing page, grandiose and silent and white, all around the autumn hair, riffling in the brook along our old mountain stair. Crows and frog, in fact, uh, yeah, right. Crows and frog. Ah, uh, summer at the languid shore in Maine. The whisper tremble of our tidal cove and fog as crows drop down in silence one by one from sentinel shoreline to dark spruce alcoves in the shadow mist. From our window view, we cannot see them in the smoothened seawall beach stones sloping toward the low tide morning hush, where patchy white gauze curtains drift and disappear. Invisibly, they pock 
the tidal beach stone cobbled field. The only sound is our sulky fire's punky snapping spruce. Then a raucous black sheen guild explodes through live spruce into our white birch woods. And a seawall stranger looms unpursued. We're still on Swan's Island. Um, in the middle of the island, there's a little, there's a pretty good sized pond. Um, and there's very little access to the pond. You'd have to walk up to your hips from almost any vantage point to, to get to any place where at least the fly rod could, you know, escape the birch trees. Um, this is a, a, a poem about walking with uh, my two sons back uh, when? Early 70s? Yeah. And um, a lot of it refers to the chart, the main seacoast chart and that uh, everybody has access to who, who lives on the coast of Maine or visits there and does any voting at all there. And uh, so I remember getting a chart from Murrick Morrison who, who, who died a couple summers after that of a, a very sudden heart attack. But I went up to Murrick's one day and uh, it, it, he lived where a house was where we picked blueberries last summer. And um, the chart was chart number 309, okay, so I, and then I wrote this poem, and then condensed, condensed, condensed. I sent it off to the New Yorker, and, uh, and, and so I got a letter back from the New Yorker, and they accepted the poem, and they said, uh, but the chart uh, is numbered wrong. <laughs> I'm saying to myself, well, you're not, I got the chart right here. And uh, so what the New Yorker does, this is a little essay about how, to, if you want to get a poem published in the New Yorker, they're going to scrutinize it, and they're going to look for every comma fault, and they're going to find something wrong with it, and they're going to add, and then they're going to tell you, you can change it if you want to. This is the fact, but if you don't want to change it, don't, you don't have to. So they're very nice about their smugness. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, I, I found out that, that the New Yorker had the poem a week and accepted it and stuff. And so they sent a guy down the street, okay, to, 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 to get a chart so they can check the accuracy of every, there's a lot of stuff in here, you know. They look over here to the left and they say, no, it's over in the right and that stuff. But you'll hear it in the poem. Anyway, what happened was they went down and they got a freaking chart, all right? And um, it, they had just changed the numbering of all the charts along the coast of the state of, the state of Maine that week. You know, that's how good they are. I mean, they're good. All right. Anyway, approaches, approaches to Blue Hill Bay, chart number, what was number 309, is now number 13313. All right? <laughs> Late June, walking the deer runs to Goose Pond after supper, summer begins. Sidestepping storm-blown poplars, dry-waiting the slash from the pulpers camps, ten years ago, keeping the imaginary straight line from Duck Island Light to the north side of Goose Pond Mountain in our mind's eyes, poking our fish poles through young hackbatack straight arms, trying to keep from snagging the green fur, the purple stars in our school desk landscape of the nautical chart. It's blue and yellow. Yellow, blue. The island woods are yellow. The evening sun sprays through from the other side of the evergreens. Wood colors, our first grade pegs arranging. We push for the first view of the marsh edge shore. Spruce stump sticks edging deep water trout, never minding the cold. We know where we are, a mile straight in on the yellow. We lose our way. 
My son climbs a blue spruce to see where we've been. The two sisters, Long Island Plantation. On the left, the Baptist Church in Atlantic. We head into the sun. Late June, walking the deer runs to Goose Pond. After supper, summer begins suddenly. Beyond the trees, they are landing, taking off, landing, salt white, fresh blue. It is all prearranged. In a minute now, we will see the pond. Nothing has changed. My mother lived into her 90th year. My father died in his 65th year because he smoked Chesterfield cigarettes starting when he was six years old. Um, <laughs> anyway, my mother actually didn't know who she was actually by the time she got around to dying. And, uh, but she was a lovely old lady. Um, I, I had a lot of problems with my mother until she sort of began to lose her mind. <laughs> and, uh, then, we, then we became great friends. And, uh, anyway, she was a nice old lady. And um, she was in her 80s, and, I, and my brother took, was taking care of her up in New Hampshire at his farm. But I would go and get her in the summertime and bring her up to the island. And this takes place um, in the summer. Uh, and she's on the deck, and uh, we're only about 60 feet from the water. And I'm up on a ladder, and um, doing some, I'm, I'm working on my cedar shingles and stuff, and I'm way the heck up, you know. And I'm looking down, and there she is. She's all bundled up, you know, and she's got a scarf around her neck and stuff, and she's got this wig on that she wore in the last 10 years of her life. and, and um, She's just a very nice old lady, and she. I, I'm going to read the poem, all right, because I'll screw it up otherwise. Um, so uh, I'm up there, and it's called Lines uh, Begun Near the Shore in a High Wind. The low roof pot swings empty over the dark deck. Two blue flags snap flutter on grommet rings down the driftwood mats. Who are you, dear? My mother asked last summer, eating her apple, her wig awry under the sweeping gull's eye, basking sweater cozy in the sun. I was rigging the extension ladder to stain the topmost cedar shakes. You mean I bore you? And she struck the driftwood railing post, laughing, nibbling her apple core to the seeds. She dozed in the August heat. I dabbed and brushed the dark oil in as the breeze wavered in cooling gusts off the water. In her sleep, she mumbled, hark, hark. Later, she said, you mustn't mind me, dear, but where have I been all these years? Now the island weather has changed again. The blue flags drape, and the fog is rolling in. Anybody know what happened on August 9th, 1974? You know, I asked this at a board reading once, and someone said, told me what happened on that day. I was just knocked off my fence. Um, anybody know what happened on August 9th, 1974? Come on, speak up. I can see some of you are thinking. What happened? Oh, I don't know. What do you mean? Who? Somebody knows. Nixon resigned. Jesus. <laughs> You're more than a candy man, I know that. <laughs> I'm a professor. <laughs> right, August 9th, 1974, all right? A summer morning. My son and I are running the Red Point Road for time. For the early, for the early breeze, 
the half high sun. Elsie Gillespie's picking raspberries by her barn garage. She waves. Overhead, the eagle from the sisters winds slowly higher. Pace it. Pace will bring us home. My son eases ahead in his long strides. There's a parked car off the road from blueberries, summer people. A bandana head looks up from serious picking. Pace it. At the turn of the woods, a crow jumps from the top of a spruce tree Caw, cawing to cronies deeper in. And they take off, protesting. I relax into pace, unclench my fists, try not to think of running. My son disappears down the hill through the otter pond swamp. I love my son. I will catch him if I can. Two miles from the seawall field to Rosie Staples' house and back, we will sit on the deck pick berries by the shore, wade in the tide pool, breathe easily. Face it. The halfway mark. My son is coming back. We nod. Arms loose, legs easy. I'm turning home. Pace will bring me home. I will not think of running. The island is cool and green. The day is long. My son is running like the rhyme. If you can, if you can, I'm running after the gingerbread man. <laughs> My son Theodore, uh, where the heck is he right now, Kabega? He's either in the Philippine Islands or someplace in Indonesia or something. He works for a company here in New York. And, and uh, they sent him over there to do something. Whatever they do. <laughs> I know it costs 10,000 10, bucks for his plane ticket. I know that. <laughs> anyway, um, he spent the summer with me alone on the island. And uh, he had the only job on the island. He worked at the, at the, at the general store, just as a handyman. And, uh, and that summer, I, I, gee, I used to know how many lobster, I mean, we put out lobster traps. I put out five traps in front of my house. and. Um, and, be, and because uh, the, the natives on the island, they, they sort of trusted me, sort of trusted me <laughs> as a mainlander. But um, they all knew that I had traps out. But I never hauled them in front of anybody. I mean, and we did it at night, you know. And sometimes in the fog. And, and sometimes uh, without a moon. And uh, anyway, this is called Hauling Traps with Theodore, a midnight narrative at low tide. Theodore must be somewhere around 10. And uh, the flashlight dangling from my neck keeps dying. I'm eyeing the low places, trying to keep upright in the wet rock weed. We're at the edge of an 11 foot tide, just turning. On his side, one foot slipping a low ledge, my son Theodore taps the seawater from his light until it flares. The night fog sickled, sickened, silkens in the beam. He answers, I'm okay, when I call his nickname through the dark and scan my light to mark his fall. Thief, I call, and pick my steps across the shell-crushed white of the low tide cold. Yes. He says, beside me, my youngest son. His name tells me what I have to know. When I am old, it will be between us, this benediction of the foggy cove, these periwinkle agate bells, 10 times 10, under our feet, as the rush of the wavelets breaks at our knees. We make our way to the weighted line seated in the crevices of the low drain ledges. Here's one, he says, as I shuffle waist deep toward the lees of the inland cove. This is the main coast, the summer of my last son at home. My life links on, off, on. I can see kelp flowing silky brown through my ankles. 
I reach now for the floating black line. The whispers from his trap, too, as I haul. You better bait, I call, our voices flowing back to back, face to face across the heavy swells. Intimacy, the declension of father and son, he and I, second persons familiar. We work in quiet. I lift the keeper and a short to the clam roller, rebate and heave the wire trap to the sea. A blush of bubbles, it sifts down, gone. We haul the other three and mount the broad-backed ledges. We count the summer's haul, secrets. I'll haul any time, day or night, he says. Inside, we take off our wet boots and shorts, stack split spruce in the fireplace. We talk, now and then, bait, my father's lobster onyx ring. In the refrigerator produce tray, the blackening lobsters wait. I remember writing 1937 on my multiplication table papers in Miss Reynolds' room in the Yellow Lyndhurst School, where 72 seemed as high as numbers were able to go. Then weekly, the 12th numeral burst until 144, 12 by 12, seemed sufficient for all the problems of life. Before I left that Yellow School, Miss Bridgham eased me into third percentage and the mysteries of higher math. And I was ready to travel the bus to junior high school in the world. All my math teachers now are dead. But the calculus of memory brings back the names as quickly as I begin to call the roll. Mrs. Rice, Leahy, Watson, Haley, and Miss Fox. They taught me more than what to count. They taught me special days and how to give the simple numbers meaning. How they all mount up one by one. Addition shows us how to live. White herons on the coast look like. I don't know if you have them down here or not, but I'm sure that you've seen them someplace. You know how they're tall and thin. And This poem is, is called Giacometti at the tide pool. Giacometti, you know those sculptures, these long, 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 tall, skinny guys, incredible. So this, so this heron arrives this morning, you know, right after sunrise, he's right out in front, and, and he's so wonderful because, you know, the sun is coming up and back in the east, and, and, he, and he's just standing there, not moving, and and, you, and, and the image of the heron underneath on the water is just as remarkable as the, as the image of the bird did herself or his self. All right. So we emerge after sunrise to see the shadow heron printed before our scalpel gaze, framed by our poplar and the peeled spruce rail here on the island shore. All else is stilled by her brazen stare, fixing us in the pool below. And when we slowly open the camera eye door, she wafts bayward, silently, in slow, soft, elegant, downsweep flight. Now, as before, when we slept, the shore is mock serene with semi-precious daybreak colors cooked egg white of the nosy circling gulls, their hooked beaks open with their eerie moans, and one black cormorant streaming southwest. The heron print stays with us through the day as the sea grinds and birches flutter behind the tall spruce blinds. I talked about Goose Pond at the center of the island. <coughs> September Sunday morning at Goose Pond. Here on the west shore where the breeze ruffles the lily pads, 
My view through the maple leaves dots the blue sky red. All sounds are muffled, except the occasional wind in the onshore trees. Dead trunks lean across my picture view, and the pond is mine. All the golden hearts of lilies white with silken spears in the blue mirrors between the skirt-split pads. Parts of my childhood drift across the gently troubled pond four wars ago. These white pond lilies bring it back, coiled in double wrap inside my mother's shallow round dish. I can hear the distant bell of the Baptist church and so gauge the bend in a gnarled white birch. Maybe one. Uh, we, we, have, we do live in the woods on the side of a little small mountain, and uh, we have a bunch of blueberry bushes that are uh, doing better lately, but have been really crappy for about 10 years. <laughs> and, uh, so I already did that. Now I'm going to switch gears. I did, I did enough of that. Um, okay. Okay, uh, this is what I'm going to do, because I'm going to change, I'm going to do something I threatened to do, and then decided against it, and then I decided I'd do it anyway. Um, rarely does a poet publish a, a, a novel. Uh, because it's a really, it's a different deal, totally. And uh, so I, I published one uh, last year, uh, a novel, and uh, and I call it fiction. But anybody, any writer that writes, you know. Novels knows that they. I mean, they're writing about themselves, right? You know, but you have to cover your, your whatever, um, and you call it fiction, and then they can't prove that that woman you know, was your girlfriend next door. I mean, uh, and uh, when you were growing up. So, um, so anyway, um, I, pu I, pu I published this novel, and I was, and I was very tentative about it, and I. I didn't really know if I had anything or not. I truly didn't. And then um, a lot of people that I like <laughs> uh, like the novel, and so that made me feel better. And uh, so I'm publishing another one next week. Um, and it's about the time that I spent in California. I I, I, I taught there uh, in the Northern Valley, uh, up in Chico. Anybody know where Chico, California is? Okay. Well, it's the Helling Gun. It's 160 miles northeast of San Francisco, and it's up in the Northern Valley. It's gorgeous. I mean, you, it's backed up against the Sierra Nevadas on one side, and then you go 30 miles on the other side across the Sacramento River, and the whole coastal range is there. And it's it's just a, a wonderful place, but it's still semi-tropical. And um, so I was out there for for three years, and I got involved in politics when I was out there, and. Uh, and then uh, I came back east, and then I was recalled to California because I was I worked in a campaign for lieutenant governor out there, and the guy was working uh, as the Northern California uh, head honcho uh, with John Ziegenthal of Bobby Kennedy's presidential campaign. So he called me, and I I went to Nebraska, and I spent some time in Nebraska with Bobby. And then, um, and then I went, and then I went home for four or five days, and then I was called to California. So I went to California, and I was, and I brought Bobby into Concord, California, the day before he was killed. And um, so I, I wrote a novel about that, and uh, and then 
after I had written the novel, um, I had written so much about all the other stuff that I was doing in California that I finally took the whole Bobby Kennedy thing out of the book. And, uh, because it's another deal. And uh, so I have this book now, and it's called Orchard. It's coming out, I think, in about 10 days. And it's called Orchards of Almonds. And uh, so half of it is, is invented, totally invented. The other half is <laughs> absolutely real. So, and they mixed it all together to screw everybody up. <laughs> so uh, I can't be blamed for anything <laughs> in the book. Um, now, in, the, in this book, it is about politics in California. It's about a lieutenant governor campaign. And it's about uh, running for local Democratic committee stuff. And, um, and, and the wife of the main character is a totally fictitious person because that, because that wife, um, we were, it didn't work out later. Okay, and I eliminated my two sons that were in these poems. Yeah, okay, so it's a story about a father and a daughter. And the, and the daughter's based on a, a real 10-year-old. And, um, and I'm going to read a, a, a small chapter of it. It's only two pages, so don't get upset. Okay. Um, But at the end of it, you see, at the, the, the real reason I'm reading it is because at the end of the novel, they come back to Swan's Island. I mean, the father and the daughter, too, because something happens to the mother. Um, okay, so that's, this is chapter 44 of a book called Fortunes of Almonds. And my wife did this incredible cover of, <laughs> of an almond orchard in California. Anyway. The problem with running for political office was that I didn't know what I wanted out of it. Butte County was too conservative even for me, a Yankee outsider. Down deep, I knew I was bored and merely wanted something to show for my days, but I didn't want to rock Puss's boat. Okay, Puss in Boots is my daughter. Her name was Boutilia, but that's such a terrible name that um, I call her in the novel. That wasn't her name. But I mean, I call so I call her Puss in Boots, and she's referred to as Puss. All right. But she's a nice little girl. All right. Late summer, late summer was the hardest. Chico was a furnace, and while Seal and Puss went to one mile in the park, I drove out to the river and fished, knowing the salmon runs wouldn't start until the fall. I got bored with fishing and took to walking the dry bed of Chico Creek, 10 minutes from the house. It cut across Manzanita after a 20 minute walk, and I imagined the black and white California quail with the little black crests jumping up from their foreheads, bursting from the dry vines draped at the turns in the creek. They say crick, don't they? Can you believe that? Crick in the creek. None of it helped. I was looking to be distracted, and I had no agenda. I thought about black and white birds falling from the sky, pheasants dropping in clumps in rice fields, deer with blazing eyes and the V-sights of my father's 32 special carbine, even of the redhead giving me directions to the real estate office, her brown freckles and white shorts, that first drive into Chico, beginning something unknown. I thought about dying, being nothing forever. I forced myself to think about Seal and Puss at the park, lying on towels on the ground next to the swimming pool across from the swings where I pushed Puss the first week they were in town when I was afraid to be alone with Seal. The swings were on the edge of the thick park woods where the vines hung down from the oak trees and the summer air was dry and the black widow spiders never moved until the sun went down. Seal was trying very hard in the marriage. We were like kids together. Every day at 5.30 in the afternoon, she would send me over to Clingman's on Manzanita to get a half bottle of red wine for dinner. For 18 cents, how can we miss out, she said. We talked a lot about our first year of marriage. It was like playing word games with close friends on swimming parties, treading water. 
My mind kept going back to the creek beds, weeds burgeoning between the bedrock, drying in the semi-tropical heat, the parched boulders hot enough to fry eggs, the crevices filling with dust and blown soil, and the mud from last year's floods caked as hard as rock. Northern California was seductive and dangerous. Its semi-tropical poisons, its easy life of plenty, summer wildflowers, yellow and prickly, the agents of a force so indomitable and natural and insensate that discussions of their beauty became models of triviality and sentimentality. I did my morning push-ups, skimmed the Chronicle except for Herb Cain, who treated the city as a neighborhood with the conversational self-applause disguised as public chatter. He began every column as if he were on the telephone, flushing all birds with the same song. Then I walked the creek bed for an hour. I did this until the end of the summer. Seal was very beautiful that summer. She had let her hair grow and it was now shoulder length, the short neck curls of fuzz growing into waves of coal black sheen. When she wound the black strands into pigtails, she looked like a Sioux Indian. Puss began to imitate her and began to look like her adolescent twin when I nuzzled Puss's hair at bedtime and whispered, Princess Valiant. She protested, Prince, Daddy, Prince. Later that night, I nuzzled Seal's shoulder tresses, seeing the quarter moon outside the bedroom window and asked if she could imagine being dead. Oh, Bill, she said, you're a crazy guy. I can't imagine anything about things that don't have to do with us. Death is only an idea. It isn't real. Besides, I expect to die first, and that's how I want it. If you died, I wouldn't know what to do. This poem, some of you know this, poem because you know this book. Um, how many here know this book? That's great. Thank you. Come in. Um, it's called Colors, Turnovers, 1933. I was born in 31. Um, and this is one of the first memories. It's not the first memory. There's, you know, there's a scene in the opening of of Henry Adams, the education of Henry Adams, where he talks about his first memory being the yellow sunlight coming through the curtains. I don't know if you know, anybody know the education of Henry Adams? Um, at any rate, I, it was, I, was, I was something. I, was under, I wasn't five, I know that. Um, because I was, out, I was out in the backyard, I was under the clothesline, and my mother had tied me to the clothesline. It was this little that went from the clothesline to my waist. And so I had to run the whole clothesline in the backyard, you know, <laughs> when I couldn't go any further. And, uh, and I remember I, it, was, it must have been a beautiful spring day. It must have been the first spring day when it was really warm. It wasn't lousy warm like it's been lately. Um, and I had on this yellow and blue sweater, and I didn't want it on. I mean, I was too hot. But she wouldn't take it off because you know how mothers, you know, all you mothers out there, you know, how, you, you don't want your whatever, you take care of yourself. So, um, <laughs> late, it's called Colors Turnovers, 1933. But, I, you know, when we were kids, and, and I'm talking about anybody over 100, like, right? Um, when, when we were kids in the 30s, I mean, everybody came to, any, all business people came to the house, the insurance man then came to the house and got his 30 cents a month from my mother, the honest to God, prudential, I can see that rock in the front of that thing that he carried. Um, the turnover lady, which she was, Cushman's paid for that thing, I'm not sure. Um, Charlie Selleck, who, who pumped out cesspools, and uh, the ash man, and I, I could name at least five more people that came to the house. But that's, you know, they did that. The mailman came twice a day and walked, all right? If you got sick, the doctor came to the house every time. And um, so it was a different economy. It was a different life. Um, it was a different America. The population of the, of the United States was 144 million. Do you know what it is today? 
most of you know, is 300 million. Okay, it's doubled. There are more than twice as many people in my neighborhood. I mean, I used to have, there were, I can count seven or eight fields in my neighborhood that we had access to, um, to play football on. And um, there were woods on the second street over from my house that went for several miles. And, and there was no little league. There was no anything. We had a high school football team. We had a girls basketball team. But the girls, half the team had to stop at half court. They couldn't go the whole length of the court. Um, and I mean, we talked differently about everything. If it hadn't been for Roosevelt and Kennedy, all right, we wouldn't have what we have now. We're, losing, we're going to lose a lot of it. So um, this is a Monday morning. I know it's Monday morning because it's the day that my mother washed every day. Every Monday, my mother washed. All right, down south, and then had to carry the buckets of water from one of the old washing machine up and throw them along the hedges and stuff. Everybody has these memories, all right, who are in my age group. Late Monday morning, I cruise the yard, tied to the clothesline, my heart string nagging. Me, I'm two on a hot May day, a little pronoun waiting for the turnover lane. My first memory, yard time, in my green wool sweater. Why won't she lift it off? My mother hums behind the screen door. Over there, her blue irises bathe in the sun. The yellow clapboards weave behind them in the dazzle. I traipse between the lilies of the valley and the lilac tree. She's inside, whistling before the stove. My mother used to sing in the house. I can hear my mother singing hymns in the house. And once in a while she would whistle, you know. Whistling before the stove, cooking our goose. She calls, the turnover lady's coming today. And at high noon, the black auto stops. A lady carries a flat square box in her arms. And she's walking up the driveway. Everything disappears under the noonday sun. Memories that, that focus on one thing, and then they're gone. Or, I mean, then there's no more. This, but you remember that one image, you know. <coughs> and so, when you're writing poems, those of you in a creative writing class, this is how you do it. You wait. You don't think of anything, nothing. You wait, and something occurs to you, and you write it down. If you're lucky, something else occurs to you, and you try to keep it going for as long as you can. But you didn't do that. It was a gift. And if you don't honor that gift, it's not going to come again. You have to wait. And it will be given to you. You should read Rilke. It will be given to you, is what Rilke says. Great German poet, Rainer Maria Rilke. It will be given to you. A little bit about my poems know that there's a lot of Working. And form is, as Brad said in the introduction, is only the pressure that you put on the on the lines. That's all it is. It's pressure. All right. Now you think that you, you, well, you don't want that pressure. Nobody wants that pressure. But if you don't have that pressure, the line doesn't become anything else. But the form of the line, no matter if you're writing a villanelle or a sestina or a sonnet or whatever, the, whatever you're doing, every poem, even without form, has a form. That is the form of the poem. The formless poem is the most difficult poem in the world to write. 
because it's inventing its own strategies of, of, of digging out the content. You see, the poem has a strategy. In your mind somewhere, there's, there's the shape of what you want it to look like on the page, whether you are aware of this consciously or not. There is a shape, all right? And it may be amorphous, but what you're looking for is to probe that shape. You may want to write a poem in the form of, of, the, word, of the letter Z. I mean, there are crazier forms than that, I mean, that people have used. But it, and, but it doesn't matter. It, does, it doesn't matter. You, you must put pressure on the form that whatever you express, which you don't know yet, because it hasn't been given to you, okay, takes. And whenever you're composing, whenever you're, well, that's a fancy word for what's happening, I don't know what the right word would be, but whenever you're in that zone of feeling the need to formulate something, it's very amorphous, you know. And it doesn't occur to you. I remember going to Breadloaf when I was a hot, sharp kid in graduate school, and I was taking poetry classes with Robert Lowell, and Ann Sexton was my buddy in the class. And um, at that time, Frost was in charge of the Frost and, a, and another fellow, I can get his name, Morrison, Theodore Morrison, the great naval historian, uh, and his wife were taking care of Frost in Cambridge. And so I had, was privileged to visit Frost several times, uh, just me and him and an Indian poet named Yataka Bharti. And so Frost, he, he leaned over the podium like this. He gave one speech uh, every, he gave one poetry reading every, uh, one night of each summer's Red Loaf Writers Conference. I remember Frost came in, he had this gigantic granite head. And he had fingers, that they were big, thick around as a sauce, as a poet sauce. And, and he's leaning over like this, and, and he doesn't say anything. He's just leaning over the podium like this. And he's looking out in the audience and saying, and then he says, has anything occurred to you since last year? <laughs> he had it. I mean, this is exactly what's going He knew what, create, what creative writing is. Has anything occurred to you? Now, if something occurs to you, where does it come from? You don't know. You have no idea. But you know that when you're in the kitchen and you, and you go into the living room to do something, and by the time you get into the living room, you can't remember what it was that you were, you were after. So how do you find out? You go back to the kitchen. And all of that environment of the kitchen, nine times, not always, but nine times out of ten, you'll rethink of what it was that you went into the living room for. And writing poetry is a little bit like that. Only the kitchen. Only the kitchen is that zone that you get in and you begin to probe and stuff begins to be given to you. Alright? Anyway, no more preaching. I started to talk about the form. What I started to talk about was the form of this poem that I'm going to read. Pickle because I must be pushing it to get time. Am I? Because you're 830. All right? Okay, this is what the poem looks like. Those of you who know the book know, know what it looks like. But it starts out with how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten lines. Okay, ten lines. And you look at the last one, the half a line. All right? Nine lines, eight lines, seven lines, six lines, five lines, four lines. Try that. See if you can make it come out. All right? <laughs> Go ahead. Try it. All right? This takes place at Grady's Lake in Afton, Maine. It's near Sanford. It's, uh, it's not very far down east. Oh, it's about 100 miles from, that's about 85, 80 miles from Boston, right? And I was, this was, this was Shangri-La. This was the Garden of Eden for me when I was a kid. 
and my father laughed. All I could think of was a clown tumbling at the spring and me grabbing the spotted brown blur in midair. I was 15 before I knew a tumbler was a drinking glass. For years it was there, upside down, and I saw it, and then it was gone. My Uncle Harry and my father were gone too. Last summer, I cleared the leaves and sticks that clotted the spring with no goggling frog, but someone had placed another tumbler on an old broken stick. Not innocent, <laughs> into that place where you go googly eyed. You know. And uh, she moved from New Hampshire down the street in Cleveland Avenue. And uh, and I read this poem at our at one of the reunions, at the high school reunions. And by that time, uh, I was married to somebody else. And she was married to somebody else. And I read this poem at our reunion. And uh, <laughs> the guy she was married to, I didn't like him much. <laughs> and he was so sort of ticked off with me that. Uh, he wouldn't come over and say hello even. But they won the door prize. They won a bottle of champagne uh, for a door prize uh, when they came in. And I read this poem, you know. And I could see him over there. He was really ticked off of me. And uh, she came over and gave me the bottle of champagne. That was nuts. I mean, that was great. <laughs> anyway, it's called A Cheer for Janice Weir, 35 years later. You were just a pint of peanuts. I was Gaga up the street. All the president's names under our feet. Down Cleveland, down Harrison, down Garfield, and Washi, and Jeffy. After dark that first spring, I learned stopping and kissing all the walk home. Your back porch with the yellow wooden rail. Sadie said Nix on going steady. One night I trailed you in my father's 38 Buick and waited for Charlie Prentice to bring you home. You ran up the front steps and in. The light went out. I drove home. Then you fainted at school. I carried you to the nurse's office. Fell asleep afternoons across the edge of your bed. You were doing algebra. I never knew what you were sick with. Once we played our clarinets in Door Memorial Church and I squeaked. You pretended you never heard. You slipped that five into my wallet on the Everett to Boston MTA. I did not figure it for a month. I was slow on the take, slower on the give. When you fell for Richard Henniger, I would not come home from college. Even Minister UD from Australia could not get me to eat. You cried in church. I screwballed off in a soggy dream. Dear Jan, with the over-the-shoulder look, we touched only with our mouths. Pert, quick-eyed, you ran like a fawn. Arm wrestled like a Japanese flyweight. Accept, if you will, this cheer, and another, and three, in my 50th year up the long, long street. If you have the money, um, poor as you are, to buy a book, uh, you get. They only cost seventy-five dollars a piece. <laughs> um, and uh, and so what I want you to do uh, before you go is uh, you have to read "Playing Glassy" with Dickie Mahler. Okay. Um, and uh, I know that 
that people want to hear that. Hear that. Okay. Um, so you guys have to read that. And any other requests for an encore? Okay. So just that one. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Uh, Massachusetts is. Uh, it's a couple of miles from Lynn. We, I could, if I walked up the street I, into a woods trying to rock, I could see the ocean. So I lived that close to the ocean growing up as a kid. Uh, no. uh, Saugus, Saugus itself, a little town north of eight miles north of Boston, was divided into sections uh, East Saugus, Saugus Center, Cliftondale, uh, North Saugus, Golden Hills, North Saugus, and Lyndhurst. But Lyndhurst was divided into Lyndhurst and Blue Ridge. Dickie Mallon lived in Blue Ridge, which is only about eight or ten streets down that way. <laughs> and, uh, and Dickie was a devil. <laughs> he caused me more trouble when I was a kid. And uh, I hope he never gets a hold of any of these poems. I've written about six poems about <coughs> None of them are flattering. <laughs> anyway, he went to my house one day. He walked, you know, he walked, you know, he was a, he was a little overweight and he had just enough tonnage to, to be, you know, assume it. And uh, he also played the, the baritone in a high school band. Uh, and he was good. And uh, and he was very good with girls, <laughs> whatever that means. And um, so he came up to my, and so he walks up to Cleveland Avenue. I'm sitting on my step, front steps. And the poem tells the story. This is a battle of, we call them glassy, glasses, classy players. Classy. I'm classy, classy players. <laughs> Playing glasses with Dickie Mallon, 1943. Now, this is the middle of the war. Alone in the garage, I work my hand through the floppy top gloss of my marble bag. We carried, I mean, we used sugar bags. Sugar bag, sugar came in cloth bags then, all right? Five pound sugar bags. And we never threw, and, no, and nobody ever threw anything away. It was the war. And so my mother saved all the sugar bags from this and all the that from that and whatever. So, but I had a, a whole bag of glasses in my sugar bag and I kept them in the garage. So, alone in the garage, I worked my hand through the floppy top cloth of my marble bag and squeezed whole handfuls of little glass balls, dribbling them on a pile in a metallic dark. I knew the crystal balls by heart. Swirls of cream and raspberries, here a wine red, here a buttercup yellow streaked with devil's grass, May, the marble season. I carried the sugar bag around the neighborhood after school, plopping it in backyards, calling for takers. We gouged holes with our heels in lawns, driveways, sidewalks, earth gutters. We scooped fistfuls of dirt with our hands, patted the edges of our holes with our fingertips, closest to the hole shot first. Tucking my thumb against my curved forefinger, I nubbed the sweet rolling glasses into the hole, every one. I never lost. I was Midas Junkins, the glassy king. <laughs> one day, Dickie Mello walked up from Blue Ridge Road and stood in the street outside my house. You got any glasses? Sure. You want to play? He dug ten giant puries out of his pocket. He'd roll against everything in my bag. And one by one, he fingered them in the late afternoon sun. Blue bachelor buttons, orange poppies, copper green lily pads. The colors were so rich, my belly churned with a lover's passion. <laughs> Mallory kept throwing them. Candle wax black, burnt pumpkin belly black, the black eyes of the new girl on her, feel, on the, on her back in the field, staring sideways. Mallard rolled them all and lost every one. When it was over, his risky, debonair ways puzzled me. What's a glassy, he said, and walked home in the dark. I felt cheated. I had everything in the bag. I stashed my glasses in the garage. Behind closed doors, I fingered them in the dark. Wow. Oh.